The men aboard the steamships John Adams, Boston, and Burnside are brimming with excitement as they make their way up the St. Johns River in early March of 1863. The 1st and 2nd South Carolina Infantries, two of the first black regiments in the Union Army, are heading to Jacksonville to make war on the Confederacy and the institution of slavery itself. These men, many of them formerly enslaved in Northeast Florida, will change the course of the Civil War over the next three weeks. I'm Brendan Rivers. I'm Tammy Cherry. And this is Bygone Jacks, our unsung history from WJCT Public Media. This episode, our first, is all about the third occupation of Jacksonville during the Civil War. The mission caught the eye of President Abraham Lincoln and helped turn the tide of public opinion on whether black troops should serve, allowing the Union Army to begin a full-scale recruitment, which some historians believe helped the Union win. And just a quick warning before we get started, this story touches on sensitive topics like race and slavery. For historical context, we'll be sharing quotes from primary sources that may contain racist or derogatory language. There are also some graphic descriptions of violence. Part 1. Making War on Slavery It's February 25, 1863, and Colonel Thomas W. Higginson, a white abolitionist and Unitarian minister, has just received confidential orders to prepare his men, the first South Carolina loyal volunteers, for a mission in Northeast Florida. And Higginson is a abolitionist, a pre-war abolitionist, a rather radical abolitionist. He's actually a a friend of John Brown, a a supporter of John Brown's. John Brown was a militant American abolitionist who was executed after leading an 1859 raid on an armory in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, in a failed attempt to incite rebellion amongst the enslaved. And he was one of these that had very early on said, you know, abolitionists shouldn't be pacifists. This is an evil that should be fought. That's Wesley Moody, a history professor at Florida State College at Jacksonville. FSCJ has developed a course dedicated to the history of Jacksonville. Their research is the basis for this podcast. One of the quotes I like uh, of Higginson is that, uh, you know, abolition is not a reform. It's a revolution. And so when the opportunity came to join the United States Army to lead black troops, he was one of the first that signed up for this. Higginson and his men are expected to capture and occupy Jacksonville with the support of the 2nd South Carolina Loyal Volunteers, a group of 125 black men that were recently recruited at refugee camps in Key West. The 2nd's commanding officer, Colonel James Montgomery, plans to fill their ranks by recruiting at farms and plantations along the St. Johns River and in the interior of Florida. The New York Tribune runs this exaggerated dispatch on the Jacksonville mission on February 27th. And a quick heads up here, the term contrabands refers to black people who escaped slavery and ended up working with the Union forces. The plan is to surprise the rebels, not with the phantom, but the reality of servile insurrection by the sudden appearance in arms in the region selected of a body of no less than 5,000 Negroes, properly led by whites and supported by regular troops. Communication has been opened and kept up for some time by trustworthy contrabands with the bondmen of the chosen field of operations. And they know when the liberating host will appear and are ready to rise in thousands and swell it to a wave so mighty that it will sweep both rebellion and slavery out of existence wherever it may roll. The question of fighting rebels with their slaves will thus be placed beyond the control of politicians. Over the next month, the Tribune publishes repeated defenses of the mission after attacks in the press from angry Northern Democrats who tended to oppose the war. Plantations in flames, white men murdered, the appealing loveliness of women given over to lust and defilement, and a general carnival of blood in the threatened districts were the mildest pictures offered to the public gaze by the irritable fancy of the incorruptible patriots who edit their unbought opinions in such disinterested journals as, for instance, The World. On March 5th, Higginson receives formal written orders, which spell out the objectives of his mission in Northeast Florida. Here's Flagler College history professor Thomas Graham. At the beginning of the war, the war 
for the United States was just about restoring the Union. And it was going to be done with white soldiers only. Black men volunteered to join the U.S. Army, but they were turned down. But by the summer of 1862, the war was not going well for the United States. There had been a bloodbath at Shiloh down in Mississippi. Second Bull Run had been lost by the Union. The invasion of Virginia had gone badly. And uh, the government of the United States, the people of the United States, realized this was going to be a long, bloody war. And the policy toward recruiting black men into the army changed. And the United States began admitting black men tentatively. Congress passed a law saying that black men could be recruited into the army for, quote, any military purpose which was ambiguous. Did that mean they would be soldiers or that they would be laborers or teamsters or cooks? Well, it turned out at least some of the Union generals, particularly those in uh, South Carolina, wanted them to be soldiers. So this third incursion to Jacksonville was partly to recruit black men into the Union Army, and partly for the, uh, the original purpose of liberating enslaved people. Higginson is optimistic, but worried about what might happen if the plan fails. Once the rebels figure out what his goal is, they'll do everything in their power to stop him. Failure could cast doubt on the effectiveness of black troops, which would be a disaster for the Union and for every black person in the U.S. But those risks seem worthwhile, Success will bolster the cause of black recruitment and could even inspire a whole new strategy to help beat back the Confederacy and end slavery. And there's a famous quote from General Sherman, uh, William T. Sherman. He was responding to, you know, one of the common things, you know, black man can take a bullet as, as well as a white man can. And Sherman's response was, yes, but so can a sandbag. Can they do guard duty? Can they do occupation? Can they do all of the numerous other tasks that we expect soldiers to do? So this was the test. And the 1st South Carolina Infantry, uh, raised up on the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia by freed slaves, the idea uh, was come down to Jacksonville, capture it, occupy it, and then see how they would do. At two in the morning on Tuesday, March 10th, five steamships carrying the 1st and 2nd South Carolina Infantries weigh anchor, form into line, and head up the St. John's River. They arrive in Jacksonville later that morning, and the soldiers take the city without firing a shot. How did they do it? That's after the break. Like what you hear? Well, there's plenty more where that came from here at WJCT Public Media in Jacksonville, Florida. So be sure to check out some of our other offerings, including First Coast Connect with Melissa Ross. That's me. The Florida Roundup. And what's health got to do with it? On this or any other podcast platform, you can also find out about programming at WJCT.org and on our app. Tune in today. Part two, taking Jacksonville. Let's go back for a moment. At the start of the Civil War, some 2,100 people lived in Jacksonville, nearly half of them black. But now, in 1863, a blockade has strangled what was once a vibrant local economy as the presence of Yankee gunboats and sporadic occupations by the Union Army give the enslaved and Union sympathizers chances to escape. Confederate volunteering and conscription have taken or driven away many of the remaining residents. Now less than 500 people remain in Jacksonville. Just a handful of them are black and fewer than 70 are white men. Most who are still in Jacksonville don't have anywhere else to go. They're too old to leave or they're women and children whose husbands and fathers are off serving the Confederacy. 
willingly or not. Jacksonville had already been occupied twice. And each time a little bit of the city was set on fire, and each time people left, uh, I should add in the, the second occupation, I think 400 enslaved black people were taken from the area around Jacksonville and brought to freedom up in uh, the Hilton Head area. So by the, by the third time, Jacksonville was not quite a ghost town, but there were very few people here. One of Higginson's first South Carolina volunteers arriving in Jacksonville this morning is Susie King Taylor, a formerly enslaved nurse, probably around 15 years old. We arrived at Jacksonville about 8 o'clock next morning, accompanied by three or four gunboats. When the rebels saw these boats, they ran out of the city, leaving the women behind, and we found out afterwards that they thought we had a much larger fleet than we really had. Our regiment was kept out of sight until we made fast at the wharf where it landed. And while the gunboats were shelling up the river and as far inland as possible, the regiment landed and marched up the street, where they spied the rebels who had fled the city. Within hours of landing in Jacksonville, Colonel Higginson issues a formal order promising to protect residents and free the enslaved. And he orders his men to leave the townspeople and their belongings alone. Higginson also orders his men to cut down the flowering linden trees downtown to build barricades in case the rebels attack. And he sets up empty tents to give the impression that he has more soldiers at his disposal than the 900 or so that are actually in Jacksonville. While the Union soldiers are shoring up Jacksonville's defenses, Confederate Florida is panicking over the arrival of so many black troops. General Joseph Finnegan, a former lawyer and businessman from Fernandina, is stationed at a camp now named in his honor, some eight miles west of Jacksonville. He only has 800 men on hand, so he sends a message to headquarters in Richmond. The entire Negro population of East Florida will be lost in the country ruin. There cannot be a doubt unless the means of holding the St. John's River are immediately supplied. The entire planning interest of East Florida lies with an easy communication of the river. That intercourse will immediately commence between Negroes on the plantations and those in the enemy's service. That this intercourse will be conducted through swamps and under cover of the night and cannot be prevented. A few weeks will suffice to corrupt the entire slave population of East Florida. On March 15th, one of General Finnegan's soldiers, a former Jacksonville resident named Davis Bryant, writes a letter to his brother Willie, saying Finnegan plans to attack Jacksonville at any moment. Of course, in shelling them out, he supposes the town will be burnt, and in my opinion, that is the only way he can house them, as their gunboats are placed in position to protect them in town, and therefore it is impossible to drive them out. All is quiet just around here now, though there is no knowing how long it will remain so. If those d***s are brought out into the state as they say they intend, you'll hear some of the damnedest fights you ever heard of, as every man of us is determined to do his best towards wiping them out completely. General Finnegan refuses to be intimidated by the Union presence and quickly starts testing their defenses around Jacksonville. Twice on March 11th, Finnegan's men clash with Union soldiers, pushing them back into town. But Finnegan's men are driven off by Union gunboats anchored in the river near Jacksonville. Finnegan tries snipers posted in a line of cottages on the outskirts of town, but they're eventually driven out and the buildings are burned down to prevent their return. Higginson is confident his men will act honorably while they're in Jacksonville, but he has serious concerns about how white residents will react to the situation. At least 26 of Higginson's men were enslaved in Duval County at one point. One of them, Sergeant Thomas Hodges, had worked as a carpenter on the house Higginson took as his headquarters. One of the big fears that, that, I mean, that leads to the Civil War is the assumption that that freedom, that independence, any kind of abolition when you're talking about slaves, to Southerners, that that meant slave revolt. Uh, That meant mass retaliation. That meant being, being murdered in your sleep. And so when black troops start coming off the boats... That's what uh, Southerners were expecting. And and to be occupied by blacks, yeah, there is definitely a great deal of tension there. Ironically, and Higginson will write about this, there was some recognition. There were some, you know, that women, uh, especially white women in Jacksonville, that that recognized men they used to own, uh, former slaves. And they'd come to Higginson and actually say they were, they were relieved at this because, you know, they know this man, and he's, you know, he's 
a good guy as opposed to some stranger from New York who knows what they're what they're capable of. Uh, so it kind of it kind of worked both ways. Still, tension grows as civilians make charges of misconduct and abuses of authority on an almost daily basis. One soldier is accused of having deeply insulted a white woman, but an investigation reveals that all he did was sit on her front stoop. There are some legitimate complaints. For example, people's chickens and pigs keep disappearing, despite Higginson's strict orders against pillaging. And this isn't unique. Troops on both sides do this throughout the war. And fences aren't safe either. After all, you need a fire to cook your chicken on. Amidst all this tension, Higginson notes in his journal, some residents stand out for their acceptance of the troops, including a grocer who's become an object of suspicion to his fellow whites due to his willingness to sell to the black soldiers on credit. One of the gunboat captains even tells Higginson that the white troops who had occupied Jacksonville the previous year were a lot rougher with the townspeople than his men. And Higginson is impressed with the restraint of men who had been enslaved here, including one of his sergeants, who points out the spot in town where his brother had been lynched after he was caught trying to lead a group of enslaved people to freedom. By the 14th of March, Higginson feels confident that his men can defend Jacksonville, so he sends raiding parties and scouts upriver to open up avenues of escape for the enslaved. Over the next few days, his and Montgomery's men go on a series of raids, returning with food, supplies, and rebel prisoners. They even bring back several newly free Black people, though not nearly as many as they had hoped to. Now, the problem with this purpose in this expedition was that the United States already knew that most of the black people in East Florida, the enslaved people, had long ago been removed. Early in the war, the Confederates realized that places like Fernandina and St. Augustine and Jacksonville could not be defended. And so slave owners moved their enslaved people into the interior, beyond Lake City, beyond Gainesville, over to uh, the Tallahassee area where they would be out of reach of Union liberating forces. On the morning of the 18th, Higginson gets a message from the enemy delivered under a flag of truce. The letter warns Higginson to get all women and children out of town within 24 hours. It seems clear that the rebels mean to attack, as Davis Bryant had expected his commander to do from the moment the Union troops arrived. Higginson replies, pointing out that he's never stopped the women and children from leaving Jacksonville. But he agrees to cooperate with the rebels' proposal. Higginson tells the townspeople he'll have a wagon bring them to a church west of town, where Confederate soldiers will be waiting. Most residents decide to stay, but around 150 accept the offer. On the 19th, the wagon arrives at the brick church on the western edge of town. As the evacuees are given over to the Confederates, a Union captain sits on his horse, loudly whistling John Brown's body, a popular abolitionist folk song. Oh, John Brown's body lies a morning in the grave, while weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save. But though he lost his life, Part 3. Occupation. Several companies of the 6th Connecticut arrive in Jacksonville on the 20th of March to reinforce Higginson's troops. 800 strong, these white men are seasoned soldiers. But they present a new challenge. Trouble between the white and black troops in Jacksonville could lead to disaster, and not just for the mission. Any racial conflict here will be widely reported in the North, giving fuel to opponents of black enlistment. As the new troops settle in, Higginson watches anxiously for any hint of friction. He feels now more than ever the burden of responsibility, as if the eyes of the nation are on him. Higginson writes in his journal that what happens here in Jacksonville could affect the outcome of the war. Now I have to show not only that blacks can fight, but that they and white soldiers can work in harmony together. The next day, another army transport arrives with the 8th Maine Infantry, 
bringing the number of Union soldiers in Jacksonville to more than 2,500. In a letter dated March 21st, the first South Carolina's doctor, Seth Rogers, writes about the first time these newly arrived white soldiers joined their black brothers in arms for a church service. Our regiment in the 6th Connecticut met harmoniously at church this morning. The prejudice of the white soldiers is very strong. Yet I trust there will be no serious collision. Our boys have seen hardships enough to unfit them for receiving taunts very graciously. A little after one on Monday afternoon, the 23rd of March, the quiet in and around Jacksonville is shattered. The enemy has brought artillery to shell the town, just as Higginson suspected they would. The two Union gunboats on hand swing into action, firing towards the west. The rebels lob a few more shells in the direction of the town, then cease fire. It's all over in less than an hour, and the quiet returns to Jacksonville. Union forces realized that it was a lot easier to capture the city of Jacksonville uh, than it is to occupy it. And one of the things that Confederate forces would do, the Florida militia would do, is before the Union recaptured it, uh, they'd taken one of the big uh, coastal pieces uh, from Fort Clinch, and they'd mounted it on a railroad car. And they would back that up into, uh, into range of the city of Jacksonville. They'd r- fire random shots into the city. I mean, just terror weapon there. And when Union forces would go to capture it, to drive it away, you just back it away uh, well deep into the interior. And then, of course, when Union troops would go back into the city, they back the railroad car uh, back up there again and and repeat the process. And it's nothing you can do about that. Uh, just try not to, you know, get hit by these massive falling shells. The day after the attack, Higginson sends several companies of white troops west to tear up the railroad track to prevent the rebel artillery from returning. Unfortunately, the Union troops misjudge the range of the rebel gun and leave too much track, allowing the Confederates to roll their cannon back into place in the dead of night and continue shelling Jacksonville. In her diary, Nurse Susie King Taylor describes that night. The rebels shelled directly towards Colonel Higginson's headquarters. The shelling was so heavy that the colonel told my captain to have me taken up into the town to a hotel, which was used as a hospital. As my quarters were just in the rear of the colonel's, he was compelled to leave his also before the night was over. I expected every moment to be killed by a shell, but on arriving at the hospital, I knew I was safe, for the shells could not reach us there. Several of the shells land in or near what's now James Weldon Johnson Park. As Sergeant Charles Codwell writes, one of the shells even crashes through the roof of a couple's home as they sleep. And in its course, it passed through a stuffed seat rocking chair on which lay the man's coat, cutting off the skirts and forcing them through the back of the chair. The window glass were shattered, and two looking glasses hanging in the room were broken, while the occupants of the bed were literally covered in plaster and splinters. These attacks are the only time that Jacksonville itself comes under fire. The second attack gives Higginson an excuse to move forward with a plan he's been mulling over for several days, head out in force toward the rebel camp. Higginson has always wanted to learn more about the strength and position of his enemy, but now he wants to make sure the rebels can't keep using the railroad tracks to get their artillery in range of Jacksonville. On the 25th of March, Higginson assembles the first racially integrated U.S. Army force to go into action during the Civil War. Their mission? Head west of Jacksonville to tear up track and gather intelligence. Colonel John Rust of the 8th Maine has assumed command in Jacksonville at this point and forbids Higginson and his men from going any farther than four miles. He's worried the rebels might attack while the town's lightly defended. Higginson writes about the mission in his journal. The mounted rebel pickets retired before us through the woods, keeping usually beyond the range of the skirmishers, who, in a long line, white, black, white, were deployed traversely. For the first time, I saw the two colors fairly alternate on the military chessboard. It had been the object of much labor and many dreams, and I liked the pattern at last. Nothing was said about the novel fact by anybody. It all seemed to come as a matter of course. Higginson's men make it to the four-mile mark without encountering any real resistance or seeing anything of interest. After a short rest, part of which is spent dismantling a railroad track spanning a creek, Higginson turns them back towards Jacksonville. As they start heading east, they catch sight of puffs of black smoke rising over the trees a couple of miles behind them. 
Then Higginson spots the rebels' locomotive-mounted cannon through the trees, raised high in the air like the threatening head of some great gliding serpent. As he watches, there suddenly comes a puff of lighter smoke that seems like a forked tongue as the rebels lob a shell in their direction. The shot explodes in the air north of where Higginson is, near where the main troops are marching. One of the soldiers is instantly decapitated, and two others are seriously maimed. Soldier Daniel Sawtell of the 8th Maine later writes about the horrors he saw there. It was a terrible sight. It was my first near view of death in that manner. The man that had his head taken off, there was nothing left but the whiskers under the chin. The other one lay on his left side. The stump of arm, the flesh having been stripped off. The white bone was sticking out and up, waving about. The blood was pouring from their wounds. But Higginson has come prepared. All the way from Jacksonville, the men of the 1st South Carolina had pushed and pulled along the railway a handcar loaded with a 10-pounder rifle cannon, which they used to return fire. For 45 minutes, both guns boom, the Confederates pressing forward as the Union troops slowly withdraw. When the rebels finally stop firing, the Union troops finish their mission by prying up enough rails to prevent the Confederate locomotive from getting close enough to effectively shell Jacksonville again. Higginson also has his men burn down some of the houses that might have provided useful cover for the rebels on their way back to Jacksonville. Higginson and his men get back to town by three that afternoon. While he's sure destroying the railroad will keep the rebel gun a safe distance from town, he's lost three men without inflicting any enemy casualties, as far as he can tell. Plus, he's learned nothing of value about the enemy. But Higginson had given his blessing to another expedition that he hoped would yield better results. That's next time on Bygone Jacks. This is Bygone Jacks, our unsung history from WJCT Public Media. Thanks for listening. I'm Brendan Rivers. And I'm Tammy Cherry. A big thanks to Jennifer Gray and her colleagues at Florida State College at Jacksonville, whose research made this podcast possible. If you're interested in learning more about the River City's past, check out FSCJ's History of Jacksonville course. And if you'd like to learn more about the third occupation of Jacksonville, check out the show notes, where you can find links to the sources we used and more.